With the Steam release, I can imagine that a lot of new players are starting the game. So if you are one of these new players, this video is for you. Hi there! I am Remagic and normally I do high-end player vs environment content and guides on this YouTube channel. I play Guild Wars 2 exclusively for its combat system in group play, trying to get the last bit of damage output out of every single situation. But in this video we'll have none of that. Instead we will take a look at the 9 professions, more commonly referred to as classes, in Guild Wars 2. When creating a character this is the first decision you will have to make. What do you want to play? From a player vs environment endgame standpoint, every class has some build setup that makes it valuable in a variety of scenarios. So unlike other games, you will never have to worry that your class choice at the beginning could get you somehow excluded from the endgame. What's more, Guild Wars 2 is very friendly towards playing multiple characters. In fact, I play all of them. So, your class choice is really up to your personal preference and there is no right or wrong choice in terms of power level. Only in terms of what you want to get out of the class you can make the right or the wrong choice. If you are like me, you have probably already read all the information pages on all the classes, so there's not much basic stuff I could tell you about the classes. What I want to do instead is go a slightly different route and instead show you something that I personally find interesting about each of the classes, which might be slightly lesser known or be slightly less basic. This is not supposed to cover everything a class has to offer. I could talk for one hour about each class. I actually do that sometimes on this channel. But without further ado, let's begin with the first class, the Thief. So the special thing about Thief is that it has stealth. In particular, you see that my smoke screen is a combo field smoke and my cluster bomb is a combo finisher blast. If you combo up a combo field smoke with a combo finisher blast, you will get stealth in an area around you. This not only applies to you, but also to up to four allies which are standing next to you. We can use this effectively to avoid fights. As you can see, the unbound spirit of agony has lost interest in us and we can sneak past this dude to get over here. And now we can wait for our smoke screen to come up again and sneak inside this building. And be able to interact with this hero point, hopefully without getting distracted. Now I've used my Shadow Refuge to extend the stealth a bit more, and I could have done that before capturing here. So, as you can see when you play with a thief, what you can expect to do is um, come up with very unique ways of completing challenges, just by applying this combo of smoke fields and blast finishes. And if you were not um, questing with a group and just need stealth for yourself, you can use a combo finisher leap instead in a smoke field for the same effect. So what makes Elementalist interesting to me is its ability to excessively combo with itself, basically. On Thief we have seen the effect of a blast finisher in a smoke field and on Elementalist we can apply the same principles um, to provide offensive buffs to our, not only to ourselves but also to our party. And 
We can do that, for example, by being on a staff in Earth Attunement, using Staff 2, then swapping to Water Attunement, using Water 2, and then swapping to Fire Attunement, using Fire 2. And this will provide us with six stacks of might and might is a boon that increases our outgoing damage. Here in this window you can see our power stat. It is currently at 2737 and once our might runs out you see where we started. So this is just a very quick way to not only give ourselves 180 power but also give it to everyone around us. And what you can now do in a, in, with, with an elementalist is that you can, before a fight, you can buff up yourself and your party and then go into the fight with those might buffs. And I will show you how this can be made even more extreme by using the might buffs on the, that are available on our staff weapon then swapping to Dagger and buffing up some more might. So here we see Staff 2, Staff 2, Staff 2. Then we swap over. Now we have here another fire field we can use. We can use this fire field. We have 12 stacks of might. And now we can fight with a much higher power stat. And the target just melts. What I find interesting about Elementalist is really this surprising capability of supporting your party. Because as a new player you might imagine Elementalist to be like a very aggressive class, which it is. But this doesn't mean that it's completely useless in a group context. You can, with, with enough practice, you can provide great offensive buffs to your allies, which makes you pretty useful. And just in case you're planning to travel around the map, you can use the same principles with a lightning field. You can, you can obviously give yourself movement speed with, with your staff 4, but with your lightning field you can also buff up swiftness to a pretty, pretty big duration to make everyone around you travel faster. The most iconic mechanic of the Mesmer is probably its ability to place a portal. Just by placing a portal somewhere in the world and up to 5,000 range away at some other place. You can portal allies between the two destinations. So the way this is often applied is in jumping puzzles that are, are found all around the world in Tyria. And if we just get started on this puzzle here. This part is pretty easy. But now we might become a bit nervous. Because we have to walk along this rope and this is not entirely risk-free. So before we risk falling down and having to start all over again with the jumping puzzle. What we really can do is use the portal as a safe state. So I can place a portal here and continue on with the mission. And if I don't need it, that's great because I just managed to get to the next part. But let's actually just make a quick copy of the portal so I can 
continue showing it. I used Mimic to copy my portal, so I have the portal up again. I can now continue on, on this safe, in this safe position, where I can't fall down because I know exactly what to do. But now I get to a place that makes me nervous because we have to like jump across this part here. And I fell. Now I would have to restart the entire jumping puzzle, but instead I can use the portal to return to my safe position. And now if I want to be safe, I wait for 70 seconds until the portal is ready again to get another safe state here. This allows you to effectively navigate jumping puzzles using the Mesmer. And not only that, you can also use this portal to help other players who fell down. So imagine you're in a group doing a jumping puzzle together and one of you drops, you can just place a portal jump down to them and pick them back up and you can continue. With the Revenant you summon ancient legends. The legends determine which utility skills you have slotted here, so you do not have any flexibility in the sense of choosing your own utility skills, however you can choose your legends to determine your utility skills. And a consequence of that is that you as a Revenant are the only class which has always access to two healing skills. You have for example the Demon Heal and then you can swap to the Dwarf Stance and you still have the Dwarf Heal. So that is pretty good for sustain. Every legend has something that is very cool about it. and. I'm going to just show you one very cool skill, which is the Inspiring Reinforcement skill. It creates a road that will pulse stability to yourself and allies, basically to everyone standing on it. Stability is a boon that makes you immune to being stunned or knocked around. And first I can show you what happens if I don't have stability and just let I get stunned, I get knocked around. Let's finish him. There was another player trying to help me. Okay, but I got stunned and knocked around. And if I have stability, I can entirely avoid this. Let me show you. I'll give it a go. Now the stun was meaningless and now hopefully it goes for another knockdown. The knockdown was also meaningless. The stability is very powerful in that sense that we get to ignore a lot of attacks that it, the enemy does. What I find interesting about Engineer is not necessarily its access to weapon skills. Most of the weapon skills the Engineer has are among average to weak. There are also a few strong weapon skills, but in general what you have in your weapon is not that important or unique. However, where Engineer becomes unique is its ability to um, use kits. And the kits will replace the weapons skills they have and then you can drop the kit again to get back to your main weapon. And this allows us basically infinite flexibility. And especially when it comes to comboing with combo fields. For example, 
we have a fire field from the from the flamethrower which we can then combo up with a blast from the flamethrower but also we can use then the blast from the shields and so on so we have a lot of we have a lot of um, unique abilities and what is really cool about engineer that is there is literally no situation where you can say engineer can't do this like if you want to jump across a you make a far jump you can equip the rocket boots and hopefully make the jump okay it didn't work but you get the idea we have we have access to a jump and if we let's say if we need access to a block we can equip the toolkit and use the gear shield to block attacks if we then want to pull in an enemy we can we can use a magnet if we need another jump we can use the acid bomb which lets us leap backwards we need healing we can go to the med kit and give ourselves regeneration and boons and more healing so there's really not a situation where we can can say that engineer can't do a specific thing and that is what makes this class so versatile and unique what makes ranger special to me is its pet system now Truth to be told, in the end game, pets will generally not be the strongest in combat. In the end game, you mostly use pets for the unique ability they provide. For example, my fanged Iboga will use a fang grapple to pull in enemies. Which you can then easily kill. And Guild Wars 2 has a, a lot of pets. For example, this was the Fang de Boga. But we, as you can see, we have access to a lot more. And you see those black spots, which are pets that I have not yet acquired. Now, how do you acquire a pet? Well, that is pretty easy. Just by traveling through the world, you will encounter sometimes pets called, or enemies called, juvenile owl for example so a young owl here and you get the interaction dialogue to charm the, the animal and by charming it it says you have tamed a juvenile owl it explains what skills it has access to and asks if i would like to equip yes i would like to and now i have access to an owl And its active ability, which I can use, can chill enemies. And this pet system, it is obviously pretty basic, it is easy to acquire new pets, but I think it gives the ranger quite nice flexibility, because you can always say that you need a specific effect, and you will probably find it in one of your pets. There are pets that are very good at stunning enemies, there are, there are pets that that give buffs like Fury, which increases our crit chance. And there are pets that can cleanse conditions in case we are bleeding. And there are pets that can heal. Basically, for, for nearly every, every effect you could desire, there is probably the pet for it. One fun pet is the juvenile warthog, which you can just let the let search the area for an improvised weapon, and then it finds a weapon. We can pick up this this improvised weapon, which now has a pretty nice effect. And actually, the scale that it found here is very overpowered because it does 22 seconds of poison and 16 seconds of bleeding, and that's pretty strong actually. It does a lot of damage too just for being a super improvised weapon. Let's try to find another. Oh, we have a Venom Sack, 
which gives them some more poison. It's not as strong, but yeah. So that's the pet system for you. When I think warrior, I really think master of weapons. The warrior can wield nearly every weapon in the game as long as it's not only for magical purposes. That means the warrior can wield maces, it can have an axe, it can have a warhorn, it can have a shield, it can, it can have a sword, it can have great sword, and with the right it can also have a longbow, and with the right um, class setup you can also wield a torch, you can wield pistol, and you can also wield daggers. So warrior is really this, this weapon master and he can do basically everything you want with his weapons. On the other hand, as a drawback, it's the least magical of classes, so you will find that most of his skills are rather of physical nature, he will just leap at an enemy and it will not have the most unique magic tricks. But if you don't want to use a weapon, that's also a playstyle that the warrior supports by going on a rampage. We transform into a berserker and we can just use a bunch of heavy hitting abilities to smash around our enemies. Now this, this is an ability that is more popular in players versus players mode because it doesn't do the most damage up front. But it's still pretty cool and gives it a, a very um, like a wrestling style playstyle as well. Along with being the master of armed combat, Warrior is also your friend for unarmed combat. What I like about the Guardian is really his defensive capabilities. Now, Guardian as a class doesn't have the highest base, base health pool um, in the game. There are classes with a lot more health, like Warrior or Necromancer. But it has very defensive skills that allow you to ignore a lot of the incoming damage and really make your enemies struggle to hurt you at all. If we go into combat, we always make use of the buff Aegis, which blocks the next incoming attack. So it's blocked, then we use another block, and we have another block, and we have another block, then we can knock it back. We can put a dividing line which it can't cross. We can put ourselves into a protective bubble where it can't enter anymore. And now our block is ready again. Block is ready. And we have another block. And we can push it back. So there's really no way that, a, that an enemy in the open world can actually threaten us with a guardian. Now I must say this is not the most effective playstyle obviously. It would be much better to just finish it already. And now you might wonder, is Guardian all a very defensive, defensive spec or does it have some damage also? And I can assure you that it does a lot of damage. And if we take it now the same enemy here, we can also just murder it. But, but I think as a as a defensive class, it has a lot of cool tricks. And what's the best thing about these, about these abilities is that they also work on allies. So you can really keep a group safe as a healer. As a new player, however, you should never go for this healing playstyle. Because while leveling, you will find that killing enemies will be much more effective. Especially if you're walking around alone. If you just take defensive utilities and defensive skills, you will struggle to defeat your enemies. So it's good to have some offensive tools also mixed in. And Guardian has both. And in the end game, it slots neatly into this defensive spec that just can't die and makes sure no one else can die.
The class mechanic of a necromancer is its death shroud. By going into the death shroud, you replace your health bar with your life force and you gain access to some new skills. Now, many players consider that to be the core element of a necromancer and it is a pretty cool thing that makes the class very tanky and also very beginner friendly. However, I want to show you something that I personally find, qu find quite satisfying and that is how necromancer deals with conditions. Now, conditions are basically Guild Wars, Guild Wars 2's way of dealing damage over time. And as you can read in this skill, blood is power, it applies 4 stacks of bleeding for 27 seconds, which would deal 14,000 damage to an enemy, which is quite strong. However, the skill has additional text. It says self-bleeding and also self-torment. The self-torment is a blue text and blue text always comes from additional traits modifying what your skills do. So this is not something you will have from level 1, but only later on in the game if you trade your class correctly. Now, we can use blood is power on an enemy to just make him bleed. However, we have these conditions then on ourselves, and we can use those conditions on ourselves to send them over to our enemy, for example with the plague signet. There are a lot more ways to send conditions over, but this is one very easy way to do so. So maybe let's just showcase what we can do. We can use blood is power on this enemy to cause bleeding on him. Then we have bleed and torment on ourselves, and we can use the signet to apply the bleeding and torment to the enemy as well. So this is just some pretty neat synergy we can use to deal with our enemies. And really stack up the conditions on the enemy. This makes blood is power. This combo makes blood is power a very strong skill because now the disadvantage of the skill becomes an advantage instead. There are also other effects you can use to convert your condis maybe into into boons on yourself or into self healing. But I think the ability to transfer them straight up to your enemy is is really what makes it the strongest. And obviously, if you're fighting against an enemy that tries to apply conditions to you, that is, becomes even stronger. That's it for this video. I hope this has been a help to make your class decision. Good luck, Interia, and remember that if you have a question, you will always find a player who is willing to answer. <laughs>